But Jesus said the only thing that you need to do is but speak the word and speak what the, what the centurion, excuse me, said was only thing you need to do is just speak the word. And I believe because I have soldiers that are under my command or centurions or soldiers, Roman soldiers that are under my command. And I'll say to this one, do this and that one, do that. And they accomplish what I ask them to do just by my words alone. I delegate my authority to them so that they can carry out what I'm asking them to do. The centurion believed the same thing. He believed that Jesus was a man of authority. He believed that Jesus was a man that only but needed to speak, that he did not need to physically expend any energy to traverse to his home, to see the man that was sick, and to lay hands on him, and to speak words of healing over him. He believed that distance was not a factor for him. He believed that distance was not a factor for him. He didn't believe that he needed to expend physical energy to go and to accomplish that which needed to be done. Now the thing is this, he had such a faith that was so strong that regardless of how far the servant was, whether it was just a few steps away, whether it was miles away, whether it was hundreds of miles away, whether it was on the opposite side of the world, so to speak. His words and his faith were so powerful that regardless of where that person was situated in this world or in this universe, so to speak, he knew that Jesus' words were so powerful that they would even reach to that particular soul and that that person would be healed in that very self-same hour. So Jesus was fascinated by this because even in Israel, when he healed people, the vast majority of times, he had to physically be around them. He had to physically be in their room, in their space, within a few feet away, or even so close that he would even have to lay hands on them, or be close enough that they would be able to hear what they have to say. In many cases, you'll see Jesus where he healed the man that was blind by spitting on the ground and mix, mixing his spittle with dirt or clay and placing it upon the man's eye. Or even as we talked about the man at the pool of Bethesda on Sunday, Jesus was right there in his, in his space so that whenever he spoke, the person heard. But Jesus was fascinated totally by this Roman centurion because if you are a person that have a position of authority and you speak to different ones and delegate your authority and empower them to do whatever it is that you're asking them to do and you carry it out you can understand the example and the words by which the centurion spoke because a person that walks in authority understands when God has granted you authority, he has not only granted you authority as a man or woman of God in the earthly realm, just to have control over the earthly things, but even the Bible says when Jesus sent out his or, uh, 12 disciples, he told them, don't marvel because you have power over devils, because you cast them out. But in other words, I've given you this authority for kingly purposes, for heavenly purposes, for godly purposes. So I'm ordaining you and I'm giving you authority authority in the name of Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God in my name Jesus was saying so that you can go forth and cast out devils heal the blind heal the sick cure the blind and raise the dead so we must have faith when we're walking or working in ministry and too many times what we see are people that are in positions of ministry that have not been ordained or equipped by God to walk in those areas. So therefore, for it yields no results. When God has ordained you to walk in a ministry and he has extended his authority to you, you must walk in absolute faith. You cannot doubt. You cannot 
have fear or unbelief in your heart. There must be the total eradication of fear and doubt from the man or the woman of God's heart. Because as long as we're doubting, remember what is ever is in our soul, whether we're speaking forth a word or not, it is being communicated to the people in which we're speaking into their lives. And they're able to see and discern that we are not walking in the fullness of faith. Now, right now, I want to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, eradicate fear, eradicate doubt from our heart from our souls, from our spirit, man, that anything that comes up against us, we will not look at it in the eyes of this world. We will not look at it in the eyes of the flesh. But God, we will be fully devoid of anything that is outside of your character or your characteristics. And God, I bind the hand of the enemy over ministries, over people, over the lives of your saints and those that follow you, that the enemy has instilled unbelief and fear in, but to Today we command faith in the name of Jesus Christ to come into their lives and overpower their lives and that this faith will be an abiding faith that will stay for all eternity. This will be the guiding source for their lives. This will be the GPS of their lives and that the enemy will never be able to cause it to be powerless. But I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you send a faith into the hearts of your people, into their spirit, man. Cause the Holy Ghost to stand up in them, but beyond, beyond anything that they see, that faith will always prevail and come to the forefront. That they will speak words out of their mouth of strong faith and strong belief, and God, those words will yield result because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. So in, in Matthew's, the 8th chapter, in the 26th verse, and he said unto them, this is now, they again, Jesus talking to his disciples. He had been with them. They saw the miracles. They heard that even when the centurion, just to back up for a moment, after he believed Jesus, the scriptures say that even one of his servants came while he was on the way back to his home and told him that his servant was healed. And as a result, he began to bless God. And just because people are not people of the Israeli faith or of Judaism, doesn't mean that they don't believe God. Because even in the Bible, the book of Acts, it talks about Stephen, who was, or, or Cornelius, excuse me, who was a centurion, a Roman centurion himself. But yet he was one that worshipped God. He believed God. And he paid much alms to those that were poor. He didn't reveal what he was doing, but because of his belief and his faith, he, he being a Roman centurion, who was truly the enemies of Israel, but yet this man loved God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his might, to which he prayed and sought God, the true and the living God. And as a result, God spoke to Peter by a blanket coming down from heaven with all manner of unclean animals. Let me dwell with that, deal with that for just a moment, why that is so significant. One, it was a mark of showing that the Jews had nothing to do with any other race as far as their religion, unless they proselyted, unless someone who was not a Jew proselyted over into a Judaism and converted. But anyone outside of Judaism who was not circumcised in their flesh, who did not walk amongst the Jews, so to speak, they were not considered to be Jews, and therefore they were considered unclean. Even in the Mosaic Law, God has set forth different uh, type animals that uh, that the Jews could not eat. For instance, they could not eat uh, shellfish such as crabs or things of that nature. The, those of us that are in the Maryland area, we love our steamed crabs, but that was one of the things they could not eat. And there were other type animals that they could not eat. So when Peter was on the rooftop sleeping, he saw a vision coming down from heaven of a blanket filled with all manner of unclean eat animals. And the Lord told him to eat, and he said, no, Lord, I shall not eat because because these are unclean, the paraphrase. But the Lord came back and told him, don't call 
unclean that which I have cleansed. In other words, he was telling him that I'm about to send you to the Gentiles. And because of Stephen, God gave Peter instructions to go to Stephen's household. And when Peter got there, because Cornelius sent someone to get Peter, when Peter came, he found a household full of Romans who were believing God. And when Peter began to speak, the Bible lets us know that Cornelius' faith and his alms and his offerings that were done in faith back to God, they were acceptable. And as a result, God poured out the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius and his whole household that they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of the living God gave them utterance. So the same thing that God had done for the Jews in the beginning of the book of Acts in the second chapter on the day of Pentecost where he poured out his spirit, he did also the same thing for Cornelius in his household because God totally looks at the heart that believes in him and that's what God responds to. God doesn't necessarily respond to you just because you're praying if that prayer is not coupled with faith. And again, I, I allude back to the message that I preached some time ago. And if God will release me at some point in time in the future, I will actually post that on social media. It calls, it's called the intensity of prayer. And even talking about Hannah, how she went to the temple and how she prayed because she was barren, but she did not open up her mouth, but she prayed in the bitterness of her soul. Sometimes the bitterness of your soul can be a good thing because it will lead you to the place of prayer to the point that you have moved all everything when you get to the point that your situation is so dire and you have no other alternatives but to turn to the living God then you will turn to him with all your heart with all of your soul and with all of your might and then there is the eradication of doubt and fear because you've reached the end of your rope and there's a lot of times that God wants us to get to the very end of our rope. He wants us to remove the safety net. He wants us to remove the knot at the bottom of the rope that will help to sustain and support our weight. But he wants that rope to be even so much so, if you want to use this analogy, even to appear as though it has been aligned or coated with grease. And you know how slippery grease can be, especially on a rope. But he wants to see that even in the midst of certain tragedy, imminent defeat, imminent loss, imminent continual sickness, imminent continual seeing your children out there on drugs and alcohol, seeing your situation fall apart, are you still able to trust me even when your eyes see the reality of what is about to happen. Now, faith is not the absence of reality because some people believe that if your reality is negative, that you don't have faith. Quite the contrary. Everybody that believed God in faith had something adverse going on in their lives and they were fully an acknowledging of it or knowledgeable of it. They weren't looking at it in ignorance saying that it does not exist. That's not faith. That is foolishness. But faith is you recognizing what really is going on, that you understand how devastating and demeaning it could be. But even dealing with the reality and understanding the reality and understanding what is happening and what is happening. And when your body is sick, you feel that. You can say that you ignore it all you want. You can feel the pain and the agony that it is causing you. God does not want you to ignore that. No, he does not want you to be in pain. But faith means that I feel this thing I'm tired of coexisting with this thing. And now, God, I'm trusting and believing you for something better. And I know that you're going to do it because faith says that you will. And your word said that you are a healer. You said that you sent your word and it healed all of their diseases. You said that you send your word and your word will not return unto you void, but it shall accomplish that which you send it forth to do. It's standing upon the word of the Lord.
Lord, in the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of your situation, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the agony, in the midst of the reality that your son or your daughter may be incarcerated or about to be incarcerated, it's seeing someone on their deathbed but still yet believe in God that there is hope beyond what I see today. And the Bible says that hope does not disappoint. But faith means that you look at the harshness of your situation, but yet I choose to believe God regardless of what my eyes see today.